program. I'm sorry this is coming to an end. I've had a lot of fun coming up with all this dragon stuff for all of you guys and gals out there. We've been inspired by dragon eggs and dragons themselves, but today's class will take a look at other kinds of mystical or mythological creatures. Mythological means not real, so they say. But before we do that, let's find out if there's any evidence that dragons really existed. One of my favorite books, this pop-up book, remember this one, Dragon World, says that bones were found in Europe in an undisclosed place in order to protect those bones. I don't know. But in the book is a wonderful pop-up skeleton of what is their idea of a flying dragon. So you can see that in three dimension in this great book. So did they exist? Who knows? Or were they just dinosaur bones that people found and thought might be dragons? I don't know. I kind of want to believe that there were dragons. But I did a little internet research and I found that as recently as 2017 in both Iran and China, they found bones that they are calling dragon bones. Now maybe it was just a species of dinosaur. I don't know. Again, you have to make your own judgment on that. There are other fantastical creatures that are thought of as mythological or imaginary. One kind of creature is a gargoyle. And I'm going to go back to my, another of my new favorite books, this Arthur Spiderwick's Field Guide to the Fantastical World Around You. And in that book, they have a drawing of a gargoyle. The book says that gargoyles are possibly a species of a pygmy domesticated dragon. I don't know. Gargoyles are those stone critters that are found on old buildings in Europe. Um, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Gargoyles can't fly, according to Arthur Spiderwick, but they can jump and leap so far that it might actually look like they are flying. They are nocturnal. If you don't know what that word means, it means they come alive at night, but they can stay very still for long periods of time during the daylight. They look for the highest roots possible, highest roosts possible, usually on cathedrals, skyscrapers, or other tall buildings. We don't have any skyscrapers here in the Midwest, in Rock Island, so probably not going to find any gargoyles roosting up there anywhere. The stone ones on the top of the old buildings were installed there as drains to let the water out. You know, on our modern houses, we have those aluminum gutters that when it rains, it moves the water away from your house. So hopefully you don't get a flooded basement. It doesn't always work. But they started putting those up on buildings to drain the water away. So that was a practical purpose. But also, some people thought that in addition to draining the water away, it was draining the evil spirits away, particularly from the churches and cathedrals. I have a picture of a... Now most of the gargoyles I found pictures of were kind of creepy, scary looking. But this one I thought was particularly friendly looking, and it is on top of the Cathedral of Bayou in Normandy, France. So I thought, let's put up something happy and positive. So there it is, smiling away with its mouth open to drain out the water or the evil spirits or whatever it needs to drain away. Gargoyle images have been around since the 1200s. Imagine that. That is a long time ago. The Rock Island Library has this book, and I haven't seen it until today. I'm going to have to look at this a little bit later on. It contains poetry, 17 poems specifically, by the writer Jack Pilutsky. Now the illustrator, Peter Sissis, excuse me, Peter Sis, just S-I-S, has won two Caldecotts um, in, the, in the past. A Caldecott, remember, is for really exceptional illustrations. I'm trying to find a gargoyle picture, but we'll go with this one. For his pictures, for his illustrations, he uses oil paint, and you probably have heard of that, but he also uses gouache, and gouache is a kind of paint, kind of like tempera paint, if you've used that in school before, you can't see through it. It's called opaque. Watercolor, if you use it right, it's thin layers that you can see transparently. You can see through it a little bit. So that's what gouache is. The idea about gargoyles began again in France during the Middle Ages. And ideas about dragons and other creatures I've told you about began ages ago. But did you know that mysterious creatures have been spotted in the United States, probably mythical. My voice is getting quieter. Here is a map that shows you the most prominent mythical creatures in each state in the United States. 
I had never heard that before. It says the most famous mythical creature in every U.S. state. It's got Alaska and Hawaii down there as well. So I'm just going to show you two of them rather quickly. Um, there's a whole story about them. You'll have to look that up. I don't think there are books. I didn't find any, but you can find these stories on the Internet. This is, this critter was reported in 1973 in the small town of Enfield, Iowa. Excuse me, Enfield, Illinois. It was described as a short creature with three legs, short arms, and two pink eyes as big as flashlights. Now, Enfield is pretty small, has a population of 596 people. I wonder why Ms. Glow is saying that. Well, the Iowa creature is known as the Van Meter monster, which showed up in Van Meter, Iowa, population 1,106 people. Mythological creatures, um, oops, I'm jumping ahead, excuse me. Let me tell you more about the Van Meter. It was a half human, half animal creature with an eight foot bat-like wing. Its forehead horn has a beam of light, like a flashlight, and it gives off a powerful stench. So I guess you know if it's around even if you don't actually see it. So those are two that supposedly, at least they made, um, they said they had sightings of those. I pointed out the number of people in the town because I grew up in a small town in Illinois and it's just not real exciting in a small town. It's fun, it's a great place to be, but not much excitement. But don't you think there must have been a lot of excitement in those two towns when these creatures were reported? So monsters, mythological monsters, can be combinations of more than one animal something called a chimera. It begins with a CH, and I thought it would be chimera. I've been saying it wrong all these years. It's a chimera. This is from the 16th century. It was an engraving. That means he carved uh, Jacopo, the name of the artist, carved into a metal plate, put lines in it. Like some of you kids have done the library programs before. We do styrofoam plates, and you carve into them. Then you ink it with a brayer. It's like a roller. You wipe away the ink that's not in the grooves, and then you press down on it and you make a print and that's how an engraving happens. So this is an engraving. It's called a fire-breathing she monster in Greek mythology. A lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. I don't know how the heck this one thinks about what to do. That's, there are three brains there and the serpent could breathe fire. So whatever it is, I would stay away from it. There's also a modern version. I don't know who the artist is, but I liked his modern version. His name is Johnny Staples, and that's how he pictures a chimera. I didn't find anything particularly bad about them. It's just that people were making up ideas about this kind of thing. A very famous artist you may have heard of, Leonardo da Vinci, who painted the Mona Lisa. When he was 16, he was putting together chimeras, but he was actually doing it with dead animals that he found. He cut them up and he put them together. And I don't even want to think about it. None of that still exists. But he was already thinking about ideas for creating mythical monsters. Imagine that. Back to earlier times. When I first began to read about the chimera, I found that it was sometimes referred to as a basilisk or a basilisk, but this wasn't always the case. In the year 79 AD, AD used to mean, I think it still does, 79 years after the death of Jesus Christ. It was like a time period thing. So in the year 79 AD, a man named Pliny the Elder wrote about a creature that was called a basilisk. Pliny had written a book about natural history. He didn't illustrate it, he just wrote it. He said that the basilisk was no more than 12 fingers in length, and people used to use, instead of rulers, they didn't have them, so they used the length of a finger as a measurement or the length of an arm would be used as a measurement. He said that they were no more than 12 fingers in length. I guess it would depend upon how long your finger is as to how big it was. That a basilisk also had a white spot on its head and it moved along upright. Shrubs were destroyed and grass was burning as it traveled along because it was sometimes fire breathing. The only thing that could kill a basilisk was the odor of a weasel. It could also die if it saw its own reflection in a mirror. So in those days, some people would carry a lot of small mirrors with them just to protect themselves. Here is an ancient engraving of a basilisk. A lot of Latin words on it. I don't read Latin. But it looks like a snake with a crown on the top. 
as the idea of a basilisk reached other countries, other images were created. Here is a 1604 woodcut. Now, a woodcut is, instead of a metal plate, they use a block of wood, they carve into it, they put ink on it in the same way, wipe away the ink that hasn't been removed or hasn't gone into the grooves, and then put paper on top, press down, and make a print. So this was from a woodcut. I don't think it looks very serpent-like or very snake-like. I count eight legs on this critter, but it is wearing a kind of a crown. Serpent-like basilisks could spit venom, venomous poison. I'm having a hard time saying venomous today. It is felt that descriptions of, and I brought my um, paper mache cobra back, it is felt that descriptions of the cobras at that time kind of led people to add that story about a basilisk because these cobras, if you ever see them in films, they rise up out of a basket when some man is playing a horn and he hypnotizes them with that horn. I wouldn't want to try that, but I guess some people can do that. So that's where some of the ideas might have come from. During the Middle Ages, stories emerged about a monster with a rooster's head and wings. It was called a cockatrice. Eventually, the words basilisk and cockatrice were both used interchangeably to refer to the same creature because the idea of this spread all over the place. They didn't have the internet. It was word of mouth, people traveling, and you know, some guy goes to another country or, or gal. Did you hear about the cockatrice over in England? No, what's it look like? Well, you could add any kind of ideas, that's kind of called embellishment. You could embellish the idea in any way that you wanted to. So there were all kinds of ideas about it. Some early art pieces. This is called a weasel combating a basilisk. Now remember, a basilisk was more serpent-like. This one again looks more like the rooster. This is a manuscript image from the 1200s from an English book called the Ashmole, Ashmole Bestiary. And I'm so glad that um, I didn't know that the library has a book called a bestiary. And a bestiary is just kind of a compilation, a collection of different kinds of myth mythical animals. And they were drawing them even in those days because a lot of people couldn't read but they could look at a picture and figure out what the story was. So when I look at this, I see that this weasel is on the neck of this basilisk. I still think it's a cockatrice, but it's attacking it. And so I think it's going to be rid of it because people felt that there had to be some way to get rid of evil. And they felt that this critter was evil. So at least you had the weasel who could get rid of it if they needed to. The next one is another engraving. Excuse me, this is not an engraving. This is an etching. It's another way to do a print. Instead of carving into it, you draw lines on the piece. You cover most of the plate. Cover line, you draw lines on the plate. You cover most of it with like a glue that won't let um, liquid seep into it. And then you drop it in an acid bath. And the acid will eat away where the lines were drawn. And then you have a printing plate that has lines in it that will pick up the ink. And you can print, out, print on it like you do the other kinds of printings. So this is called the fable of the basilisk and the weasel. I'd still call it a cockatrice. It looks like a rooster to me. It was created by Marcus Gearhart's the Elder in 1567. And again, basilisks are afraid of weasels because the weasel cannot be killed by a basilisk. Did I mention that the glare of a basilisk or a cockatrice can kill a person. People were very afraid of that. So the weasel could take care of it. And I read that the reason that the weasel could take care of it was it ate a plant called a rue, R-U-E, which smells like evergreen. So you'd have to do more research if you want to find out more about that one. But I learned a lot about these creatures when I was doing some research for them. Now, moving ahead into here, in the year 1806 was another engraving by Friedrich Johann Justin. He lived in Germany, a picture of a cockatrice. Again, he's calling it a basilisk, who knows? Um, but again, over time, the words were used interchangeably. Now, the last picture that I want to show you is again from that Arthur Spiderwick's book. This is a picture of what to me really looks like a rooster's head. So that one is called a cockatrice. 
And in that book, it says, a cockatrice can cause death with a single glance. Anything catching sight of it is turned instantly to stone. A cockatrice is the product of a seven-year-old rooster's egg. Now, wait a minute. Roosters don't lay eggs. That's a hen. But this is what they said. I didn't make this up. It, I found it in a book. It was laid during a full moon, and it was hatched for nine years by a serpent or a toad. I've never heard of a toad sitting on an egg to hatch anything, have you? If a cockatrice hears the crowing of a rooster, the cockatrice will have fatal fits, and it will thrash itself to death. So apparently that's another way to get rid of a cockatrice. Have a rooster around and have it crow a lot, and then the other guy will go nuts, and that's it. Problem solved. So I told you a bit about some of the differences between the cockatrice and a basilisk. Uh, again, a basilisk was a serpent or a frog egg that could be hatched by a rooster. Fairly small, not bigger than six inches, about like that. But the cockatrice was a rooster egg. I don't see how that's possible. Hatched by a serpent or a frog, and it's usually shown as being half rooster or half serpent. I hope I don't have you too confused. Borrow a book at the Rock Island Public Library, and you can, that will help you to figure it out. I think it's time to make some art. You're going to need the illustration page from your folder. I've got mine right here today. The illustration page will say class number five. You also need a sheet of W paper. And you also need a sheet that says D for drawing. Miss Glow has managed to misplace her class number five sheet. Let me find it here. I had it today. Well, I can tell you about it. What's on it are all kinds of illustrations of a different kind of cockatrice. The one that I liked is on a shield, and it's called heraldry. Heraldry means back in the Middle Ages, people did a design on a shield or a banner to represent their family, and they had some kind of an image. And apparently, a cockatrice was sometimes used for that. Seek and ye shall find. Here it is. Okay. There's the one that I decided to illustrate for you today. There's all kinds of them here, different poses. I like this illustration at the top because it shows a human being the difference in size between a cockatrice and a human being. So you can choose whichever one you want, or you could create your own idea. You don't have to use this. This is to help you if you need some ideas and you're having a hard time coming up with them. So this is the one that I was working on last night, and as I drew it, I realized it was very much like the one that I drew for you last week, except the one last week didn't have a rooster's head and it didn't have these giant legs. But if you think about practicing something makes you get better at it, why not draw another creature that's very similar to one you might have already drawn? It will just improve your drawing. So if you recall, I said artists think about shape when they're drawing. So when I look at this critter up here, I'm going to call it a critter, I still see this kind of, let me refine this. You guys have erasers. I've got my, my magic cloth here. I still see this kind of curve that goes down and curls into a tail. You see that, I hope. The head, I'm going to think of as an oval, or I see as an oval, so I'm just going to put an oval in. The beak is like a triangle. So this isn't my finished product. This is to help you see the different shapes that are in the cockatrice. Because it is three-dimensional, you need to do a second line to give the body some shape. I always suggest when you're starting out, draw very lightly so that you can do some erasing if you need to. Some people are just, they're very good at drawing first line. I never am. I'm always picking away at it, and I wish I wouldn't do that so much. But I just like to always refine this. In fact, I'm going to make the tail a little bit different because when I look at this picture, to me, I've gotten too much of a little circular twirl here. I need to bring it around here. And then sticking out the other side is a sharp tail. I notice on the cockatrice that usually the tail ends in a point. I suppose that makes it even more dangerous. It can stab things with that or something. 
So you've got the tail coming out. Then you've got these two very long chicken legs. Now, to me, the claws are a little bit more um, tricky to draw. So simplify. Start with a stick leg. It comes down, but then it comes out this way because it's got to hold up this body weight. So it comes down and then turns a little bit. And the second one does the same thing. The claws may look a little bit difficult to draw. Simplify. Start out with just stick lines. You can always refine it. That means you can always erase it and give them more shape. How many toes does a cockatrice have? It looks like maybe at least four. Okay. So then I want to make this look a little bit more real. So I'm going to give it some shape. And just like human legs, the top of our leg is thicker, comes down to where the knee joint is, and then it gets a little bit skinnier. So the same leg would be the same way, gets a little bit skinnier. Now, to draw this claw, I've just got, I'm going to come over here because I think you can see it better. I just have this leg coming down with these little sticks coming out. To change it into more of a claw, I'm going to give it a double line and a little bit thicker at the end where the sharp part would be. And the nails, the nail of the claw, is just a triangle shape. So come back to my regular picture here. I'm just kind of making it up as I go. Might be more accurate if I looked at the picture, but I'm not going to worry about it. A couple more claws down here. Okay, that's starting to take shape. This one's a little funny. Might have to clean up my lines a little bit. Now, the chest of the rooster, and I don't know if this is supposed to be feathers or what, what that is, but um, because it's a rooster, I'm going to come back up to the head here a little bit and shape this a little bit better. His beak kind of turns at the bottom a little bit. He has a rooster's comb called. If you grow up on the farm, you get more familiar with all of these terms. And roosters, real roosters, can be pretty vicious. We had one on the farm that used to chase me. I didn't like it. I remember hiding around the corner of a building looking out, and it came up behind me and pecked me. So it was a sneaky bird, but it became dinner one day. So The um, eye is an oval. I think the eye is funny on this guy. The pupil part is down at the bottom. And I like all the little designs that the artist who created this put on this. I don't know what those dots mean, but it all adds something. Now, the bottom of a chicken or a rooster, they have what's called a waddle. I used to know what that was for. I don't remember anymore. It's just two, two loopy things like this. I don't know if it has to do with digestion. I'll have, I'll have to do some research on that. So you've got the waddle, and then you've got... I don't know what this upside down heart shaped thing is at the bottom. I'm just going to draw it in. You've got all of this here, which to me looks more like a dragon's body. And I'm making them square and they should be rounded. Looks more like a dragon's body than chicken feathers. But I've never seen one of these, so I have no idea. Now I need to bring this over just a little bit. I see in my picture that whatever this part is, it comes over a little farther here like this. I think I made it wider than in the picture, but I'm not going to worry about it. I think you can get the, the general idea of what it looks like. Okay. The wings. I think it is so fun to draw wings. I don't know about you, but I think it's fun to draw wings. And if you think they look too complicated, when I look at these wings, I see a bunch of triangles. So tell your brain, they're easy. All I have to do is think of a bunch of triangles. So I'm going to draw the overall shape up here. And they're sort of like bat wings, and it shows both of them. You can see the little edge of the one in the back. So it's got the idea of two wings here, and they are pretty big. I would imagine this bird, if it's going to fly, needs a wing that's pretty big. I don't know if I said anything about flying or whether they fly or not. I have no idea. But if you're having trouble drawing these wings, just think about, see how I'm just drawing in triangles here? 
all coming down from the bottom. And I need about one more triangle here. And then I've got wings. I just did triangles. And then I curved this part out a little bit on the sides. So that is my wing. Then at the bottom of this creature, this dragon-like body thing continues. Let's see. This needs to come down. I'm going to refine this a little bit. This needs to come down more like this, I see, for my picture. And there are more of these shapes that look like the dragon body coming all the way down around this character. Comes on top of where the tail is. They're getting smaller and smaller so that they can wrap around this tail. And they kind of sort of end over here. And then I see that there are points, like on the back of a dragon. There are points up here. I need a few up here. They're just triangles. Not difficult to draw. And there are lots of marks that might look like feathers here. Okay? The legs, if you want them to look more chicken-like, it doesn't show this in the picture, but sometimes I just put these kind of little curved lines part of my leg over here. Okay. So there's a lot of pattern and design in this, but that's because this is in black and white, and to make it more interesting, the artist would do that. You are going to use, hopefully, color with yours. Okay, I think I have most of the important parts. There's a few things I haven't put in here. There's more of a, you know, there's like a feathery thing that comes over here. I'll just do this, zigzaggy lines, and this part comes up here. But I think overall, you can pretty much tell what this kind of a creature looks like. So the colored pencil part. What I did with mine last night, always right at the tail end of things. I first drew this. I meant to make a copy. This is actually a copy. I wanted to show you stages of this. But I first drew it in pencil very lightly. Then I went over my pencil lines more heavily with my ordinary pencil. Then I started shading in with my watercolor pencils. Now, I had an advantage over what you have at home because I happen to have a little pencil that is called a sketch and wash pencil. I don't even know if I put it in the bag. I don't have much left of it. But if you can see where I started shading here where it looks more gray, I held my pencil little kid grip sideways, started shading in with the gray because since I first drew that shield shape, I forgot to mention, I drew a shield shape on here and I wanted it to look perfect. There's that word again. So to make it look perfect, I take an old piece of whatever kind of paper I have. I have a stack of stuff that's printed on one side. I folded it in half like this. I used a ruler so it's even all the way down, and then I just cut a curve, and then I opened that up and traced it onto my paper so that I have this shield. You don't have to do that, but that's the look that I wanted with this. So the reason I shaded this in with my ordinary pencil is I want it to be gray. I guess I thought it might end up looking more like metal when I'm finished with it. You could use your ordinary drawing pencil and do the same thing, or you could use a thin layer of your black watercolor pencil, very thin, using on the side of the lead, then go over it again on the side with the white pencil. So you're mixing black and white. What do you get when you bl use black and white? Anybody out there? You get gray, or you should. So you could do that. So I started with that. Then I started putting in my colors. Now, I didn't know what color a cockatrice is. I guess maybe I was influenced a little bit by some of the colors that the illustrator Tony D. Terlizzi did in Arthur Spiderwick's book. But I also know that roosters very often have an orange head, so I use some orange and some yellow up in here. I use some red mixed with orange up in here. And you can blend these colors if you don't get too heavy from the beginning. You have to use a lighter touch, and then you can mix several colors. I didn't know what color to make this chest, so I decided to start using some yellow in here and then some light green, and then I got heavier with dark green in through here. 
the wings, I just felt like I wanted to use purple. I just like to use purple sometimes. And purple and orange are very good together. They work well in compositions. So I started putting the purple in this piece. So that's as far as I went with this. And then I got out my brush and some water and I started putting a very small amount of water, just a little bit on the tip of your brush. If you dip the whole brush in the water container, tap it on the side, get rid of some water or dab it on a, on a Kleenex if you need to. But I started adding just a little bit of water to make this look more painterly. Now, when I finish the piece, I'm not gonna put water on the whole thing. To me, for me, it's more interesting if I leave some of the texture of the pencil and then create some of the colors to look more like paint. It is up to you. This is your art project. Um, I think that's all I need to say about this. I don't want to forget anything here. Let's see what else I might have about this. Oh, the D paper, that again is for you to sketch. You might want to do a couple practice things on that first. And I always like to keep those sketch pages. It's like having a sketchbook. It helps me remember what I was doing and helps me improve upon things. So it doesn't mean you have to throw it away if it's just for practice. I like to keep it with my other drawings, although my husband would say I never throw anything away, so maybe that's just me. When your drawing is finished, please write something about it. Write what you, what you were thinking when you were doing it. What if you decided to create and draw your own Chimera, a couple animals put together. What would that be all about? What could you write about it? I, when I started thinking, okay, what would I combine? I, don't, I thought cats and dogs, because so many people think that cats and dogs don't get along, but sometimes they do. But maybe you could do a cat and a dog and a snake chimera. It seems like chimeras have three, three creatures together, so you would have to come up with what you want to use for that. And write a story about it. I'd love to hear what that story is. If you can send it to that email that I've given you, that's fine. It's up to you. If you get too busy and you can't do it, that's okay too. Thinking of stories. I needed to let you know, or I want to let you know. Okay. Another one of these boxes on my porch. Another brown box with copper corners, if you recall from the other, and, and brass handles. There's a word on the side. Huevo. It might be Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. So I thought that I would um, open it up and see what's inside. What do you think? Another dragon egg. This one's bigger, but lighter weight. I don't know what that means. I wasn't sure what it was, so I went to that Harry Potter book where the illustrator has made this egg chart. And I think what comes closest to it is this turquoise colored Peruvian viper tooth. I wonder what that would look like. Well, here's the picture in the book. This is what the Harry Potter book says a Peruvian viper tooth would look like. The story is continuing. Imagine that. I hope you had fun with this. This is our last class, as I said. I would say to you, keep drawing, keep creating, keep imagining, keep writing, because you'll only get better and better. Keep track of all those things. And so I want to say on this final class, happy dragon, you could read that, tales. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.